Hello and welcome to our final week of the story of Christianity. Today we're going to be finishing up our third lecture on the 20th century by looking at some of the major theological and uh, historical themes coming out of Europe in this period. At the end we'll try to wrap together some of these themes we've seen over the past three lectures. Today we're going to begin by looking at the theology of Karl Barth and his um, neo-orthodox movement coming out of post-World War I Germany and how this interacted uh, with especially the Nazi regime. Then we'll also look briefly at the rise of communism in Eastern Europe and the decline of religion in Europe as a whole. We'll then look at 20th century Catholicism and especially the events surrounding Vatican II, which is one of, uh, if not the most significant event in Catholic theology since the period of the Reformation. And finally, we'll briefly look at uh, evangelicalism as it enters into a broad international context with the Lausanne Conference in 1974. So let's begin by backing up again to one of the most significant events of the 20th century, World War I. It was with World War I that the crisis of liberal politics in the 20th century really came about. Throughout much of the 19th century, there was this idea that progress and human fulfillment would inevitably increase throughout history. This is, in some ways, a secularization of the Christian hope of the second coming of Christ and the millennial kingdom. However, the hope in science and technology, as well as liberal theology, that was meant to produce peace and prosperity throughout the world, had in fact led to one of the most deadly conflicts in human history. The technology that was seen to produce progress actually led to the trench warfare, and the series of alliances that were hoped hoping to produce peace in our time, ultimately led all the European nations into a war that they could not have predicted. And even after the war, this hope maintained. The war was often called the war to end all wars. However, this would not be the case. World War I itself would kick off a series of other crises that ravaged Europe for much of the next two generations. World War I led to economic collapse thereafter, and ultimately into World War II. In response to this, a new theological movement was developed, spearheaded by the pastor theologian Karl Barth. In fact, Barth's entrance into the theological scene was propelled by the devastation seen from World War I. Barth himself had been trained in the classical liberal theology that we've discussed before, but he became disillusioned as he took a pulpit in a small Swiss town. He found that much of the theology he'd been trained with in university was unable to meet the spiritual and pastoral needs of his small congregation. This was exacerbated by the events of World War I in which many of his theological professors, the heart of theological liberalism, signed a petition supporting the German side in this event, supporting the Kaiser's um, policies towards the West, including, uh, most famously, Adolf von Harnack, whom Barth had studied under. In a response to this, Barth wrote his commentary on the Epistle of Romans, seen above. This was not your traditional sort of commentary that went verse by verse, but it was a thematic exploration of the themes of Romans. And one of the most essential things for Barth's theology was re-emphasizing the transcendence of God that God is wholly other, that God is holy, that he is beyond human comprehension and thought, and that humanity must rely upon God in order to understand who God is. So therefore, humanity becomes dependent upon the divine for their existence, which cuts across all the major themes of Protestant liberalism that we've seen before. Barth's theology, which came to be known more broadly as neo-orthodoxy, proved very influential throughout the West in the wake of these new disasters and sufferings. In fact, the neo-orthodox theology, also perpetuated by such figures as um, <clears throat> Emil Brunner, would uh, in some ways revitalize even American theology in the 1950s. We can maybe correspond that to the uh, check against liberal theology in the mid-century in America. Some of the themes of neo-orthodoxy would directly counter that of the liberal movement. He, Bart would emphasize God's transcendence over human reality, and in by, in by doing, he would bring back to prominence doctrines of the Incarnation and Trinity into mainstream academic theology, which had been downgraded throughout much of the 19th century through liberal theology. Recall, many liberal theologians would deny the truth of the Incarnation and therefore the Trinity itself, opting for a more um, generic theism and Christ as the height of humanity instead of God incarnate himself. 
To break out a little bit of this, let's compare some of Bart's themes to the ideas of classical liberalism that we've looked at before. For Bart and the neo-orthodox movement, God is radically transcendent. He is wholly other. That is, he is fundamentally different from the creation in which we inhabit. God is God and we are not. Therefore, um, this rejects the kind of imminent view of God that we see in the liberal tradition. That God is accessible to us in this world by our own human efforts, that uh, in even some liberal circles, God is actually manifest within the unfolding of history, that history is in some sense the history of God's own being. Bart would reject all of this, focusing much firmer on the God of the Bible who transcends all human categories, who is uh, all-powerful, all-knowing, um, and omnipresent, but in such a way that he is transcendent and not contained in any space. Therefore, if God is so transcendent over us, Bart emphasizes that God must break into history. Therefore, revelation must be the ground of all theology. Bart, in his first commentary on Romans, which I should have noted was often called a hand grenade thrown into the playground of the theologians, um, for this, the holy other, that is, the transcendent triune God, must break into human history in a supernatural way. This is the doctrine of revelation, which is grounded for Bart in the doctrine of the incarnation itself. Therefore, Bart rejects the liberal emphasis on naturalism, this idea that there is no, nothing accessible to human conscious that is not merely of this natural order. The locus of this for Bart is the work of Christ. So, the work of Christ is our only means to know God and to return into relationship to him. Therefore, rejecting all understandings of human achievement or work to gain God's favor. Therefore, this rejects the largely humanistic element in liberal theology, which leaves humanity as the height of creation. Bart views humanity very much under the power of sin and need of the redemptive work of Christ. Because, as Bart emphasizes, apart from the redemptive work of Christ, we are hopeless. So, Bart actually returns to many classical theological themes of the Reformation period and updates them in some ways in um, his own unique style to reintroduce them to the modern world. He rejects the optimism found in much of liberal theology, which had become rather um, defunct after the various tragedies of World War I and World War II. Beyond the commentary on Romans, which would have uh, massive influences on theology, in which Bart would write a second edition shortly thereafter, the main way that Bart's theology was trans, uh, trans, kind of transported to the theological world was his unfinished 14-volume work, Church Dogmatics, which he began writing in 1934, and the last volume coming out after his death in 1937. The central theme of Bart's whole theology is that Christ is the full self-revelation of God to humanity. So this comes out of his themes that because God is wholly other and humanity in sin is hopeless apart from him, what we need is God himself to come into human history and reveal and redeem his people. Therefore, revelation is really the heart of Bart's theology, and not just revelation as understood through the Bible, but Christ himself as the revelation of God's self-understanding. So Bart will emphasize that only God can reveal God's self to humanity, and this is done purely and fully in the Incarnation. This is how Bart puts it in his discussion of revelation in the uh, second volume of the Church Dogmatics. He says, as the self-offering and self-manifestation of God, revelation is the act by which in grace he reconciles man to himself by grace. It is also the radical assistance of God which comes to us as those who are unrighteous and unholy, and as such damned and lost. In this respect, too, the affirmation which revelation makes and presupposes of man is that he is unable to help himself either in whole or even in part. The revelation of God in Jesus Christ maintains that our justification and sanctification, our conversion and salvation, have been brought about and achieved once and for all in Jesus Christ. We see in this a complete reversal of the liberal project of the 19th and 20th century. This idea that the only way to know God, even in the modern world, is still through his own self-offering, self-manifestation by grace. Bart is drawing on here many themes that he took from the work of John Calvin and many of the uh, Reformed scholastics, as well as meditations on Luther and modern theology all mixed into one. 
I feel that this quote helpfully summarizes many of Bart's central themes and why evangelical and even conservative theologians can engage with him profitably. He emphasizes that human salvation is by grace, only exhibited purely in Jesus Christ, and it is in Christ that we come to know God himself, because as God is transcendent, only God can reveal himself to his creatures. These emphases will propel Bart into one of the most uh, difficult times of modern European history in response to the rise of Nazism and the Second World War. So Bart was instrumental in Germany in responding to the Nazi regime, and especially the co-option of Nazi ideology by the so-called German Christian movement. These were a group of prominent German Protestants attempting to remake Christianity Christianity to conform to Nazi ideology. You can see the flag above me, which was the symbol for these Deutsche Christian, uh, the German Christians. And it quite problematically, obviously, uh, combines the symbol of the cross with the Nazi swastika, trying to make the church just another subservient member of the Third Reich. And this would begin by absorbing the Nazis' racial, racialist regime, their kind of false racial science and lies about Aryan supremacy. For instance, the German Christians rejected completely the Jewishness of Jesus, which was sadly a tendency within a lot of 19th century German thought, even going as, as far as to reject the Old Testament itself as corrupt and not canonical because of its Jewish roots. They would therefore promote German nationalism and the strong leadership of Hitler as the Fuhrer, as the proper heirs of the Lutheran Reformation, seeing in Luther a prototype for a figure like Hitler. You can see how this would be quite problematic. And in so doing, because they're rejecting the inheritance from the Old Testament and the covenant of God with his people that the Gentiles have been welcomed into, they needed to create a deeper historical root for their so-called German Christianity. And they did so by finding it in neo-pagan themes taken from ancient German mythology and pagan practice. And finally, they pushed for the official German denominations to include a so-called Aryan paragraph. What this did was exclude all non-Aryan people from the church. That is, all people not of Germanic or Nordic stock, as they would say. In this, they in some ways republic, republicized the um, struggles of the early church to reckon with the Jew and the Gentile relationships within the church, but in such a way that they reject all Jewishness and make Christianity once again a, um, or for the first time, honestly, an ethnic religion. As you can imagine, Bart's emphasis on the transcendence of God, the uniqueness of Christ, had to be opposed to this, and so did many other Christians. With the rise of Nazism in the 1930s, the, the German Christians gained, um, vast influence within the German Protestant churches and had to be opposed by a movement known as the confessing churches, that is, those who confess the truth of Jesus Christ. Therefore, in protest against these German Christians, the confessing church issued the Barman Declaration, which was largely authored by Barth. This is a very excellent confessional work that's pushing back against the co-opting of Christian themes, not just by Nazism itself, but by all worldly powers that would seem to use the church to its end. For instance, one part of the document says, we reject the false doctrine that the state should and could become the single totalitarian order of human life, thus fulfilling the church's vocation as well. We see in this a mixing between nationalism and the mission of the church, such that the state comes to take its place in the German Christian ideology above the church to be the vehicle of the kingdom of God within this world, a temptation that is borne out continually throughout the 19th and 20th century. We can also see Bart's influence in the first uh, article of the Barman Confession. He writes that Jesus Christ, as he's attested to us in the Holy Scriptures, is the one word of God, whom we have to hear and whom we have to trust and obey in life and in death. We reject the false doctrine that the church could and should recognize as a source of its proclamation beyond and besides the one word of God, yet other events, powers, historical figures, and truths as God's revelation. This is directly contrary 
to the German Christians claim that the revelation of God is made manifest in uh, Nazi ideology, but rather an affirmation of the truth that will stand throughout Christian history, that only the revelation in Christ as set down in the Holy Scriptures is the source of revealed truth. So this is an immensely Protestant doctrine uh, document that's trying to push back against the corruption of Christianity and Protestantism specifically within the German Reich. And uh, we owe much gratitude to the confessing churches for their witness to Christ in these horrible situations. Another significant figure of the confessing church movement that you've probably heard of is Dietrich Bonhoeffer who was a Lutheran pastor and um, professor in Germany at the time. He would die in part for his anti-Nazi activities, including being a part of a plot to assassinate Adolf Hitler. Bonhoeffer's theology is significant beyond his lifetime for a couple reasons. Um, in his own period, Bonhoeffer is a rather average pastor. He's active in the confessing church movement, but was not seen with... Um, he was not seen as a great thinker or theologian of the level of Bart, for instance. However, after his life, and especially because of his death under the Nazi regime at, in a concentration camp, Bonhoeffer's profile throughout the 20th century uh, would be vastly elevated. His two, uh, there's two real strands of his influence in modern theology. The first is through his more pietistic works, Life Together and the Cost of Discipleship, which have influenced 20th century piety to a great extent especially with his emphasis on communal living and the imitation of Christ. In another rather, un, uh, rather surprising turn, Bonhoeffer's letters from prison while he was in the concentration camp, which hinted at a future for a religionless Christianity, that is, a Christianity that was not based on any external form, uh, was developed in liberal circles in the 1960s for the Death of God movement that called Christianity to move beyond religion itself, and for them that meant God. So Bonhoeffer has a very um, bifurcated uh, influence on 20th century theology, which is rooted in his commitment uh, to the confessing churches in the Nazi period. Right, so Bart has been extremely influential and is almost routinely called the most influential theologian of the 20th century. He reset the entire order for modern theological pursuits, overcoming classical liberalism, and injecting back into modern academic theology an emphasis on the Incarnation and on the Trinity, and doing deep theology that is not itself bounded by the theological concerns of the day. Um, Bart is still undergoing somewhat of a renaissance in academic theology even to this day, with many new studies being published on this theology every year. However, Bart has had rather a complicated relationship with evangelicalism. Um, the evangelical church initially was quite suspicious of Bart's thought, largely due to his doctrine on scripture. For instance, for Bart, scripture is not the word of God or revelation itself but is rather a witness to revelation and becomes the word of God in God's free act. Meaning that, uh, according to Bart, God is free and is not bound even by the words of scripture for his self-revelation. Now, it depends on how one interprets this uh, in Bart's thought, but it has been the main um, point of contention between most evangelicalism and conservative reformed Christians on Bart's theology. One, um, contemporary Christian theologian Kevin Van Hooser has argued, and I think persuasively, that Bart's understanding of scripture and revelation is hampered by his failure to understand the distinction between inspiration, that is the spirit inspiring the biblical authors for an inerrant text, and illumination, which is the spirit's work in illumining our own minds to understand the text. By collapsing these two distinctions, Bart ends up with a scripture that is not the word of God, but only can potentially become so by a special act of God. And therefore, he kind of demotes the text of Scripture to a potential uh, encounter with Revelation, instead of Revelation itself that we must read in humble reliance on the Spirit and overcoming our sins and limitations. The attitude to, towards Bart in evangelicalism initially was quite negative, um, as I mentioned, especially by such figures as Cornelius Van Til, who saw in Bart uh, just a recapitulation of many modernist themes. Um, 
Others have been more generous and have been engaging with BART on a deeper level in the past generations. It's probably safe to say that BART is very worth engaging with if one is interested in academic theology. However, his writing style and um, his own theology is quite complex and it's often difficult to understand exactly what he means by what he's saying. He's worth engaging with with evangelicalism. He is definitely not the threat that he was once thought to be, but also those who would uncritically adopt Bart as the mode going forward for uh, evangelical theology probably are not being critical enough. All right, so this is the first major movement I wanted to look at of this period, the neo-orthodox movement propelled by Karl Bart. This would drastically reshape theology in the 20th century in a more orthodox position. And, and for that, we can rejoice, even if there are several emphases in Bart's theology as a whole that we should not follow. Let's move into another major event in 20th century thought, and that is the rise of communism in post-World War II Europe. So after World War II uh, had devastated Europe, the fires of optimism that we mentioned that had been dimmed by World War I were pretty much extinguished. With the Soviet Union, which had undergone a communist revolution in 1918 at the end of World War I, holding sway over the vast portions of Eastern Europe, inst installing within them communist regimes. This led to the immediately new conflict that we've talked about briefly of the Cold War that pitted Soviet Russia against um, the United States and Western Europe, pitting the forces of communism against those of capitalism. In this, um, a communist regime basically came to overshadow all of the traditional homeland of Eastern Orthodoxy. And these regimes were extremely harsh and dismissive of Christianity, going back to the fundamental concepts of Marxism from which they sprung. So Karl Marx, who would be the um, inspiration for communist regimes led by the likes of Lenin and Stalin, argued that Christianity and religion itself was merely... Um, the opiate of the masses, or that which was used by the powerful to keep the um, normal people in their place looking for life in another world and not and being focused away from the struggles and perils of this life, therefore keeping them away from political action and revolution that Marx said would be the inevitable result of class consciousness. Therefore, as the communist regimes took over Russia, they suppressed the Eastern Orthodox Church, um, with many priests um, being uh, executed and exiled. This program would extend into Eastern Europe after the Cold War and the fall of what we call the Iron Curtain, which separated the Western world from the Soviet world. In doing so, all of these churches were deeply under uh, strain for most of this period. And in the 20th century, Eastern Orthodoxy largely steps out of the stage uh, until the fall of communism that we've mentioned in the late 1980s and early 1990s. Partially as a hangover from these events of World War I, World War II, and the rise of communism, as well as the horrors of the Holocaust as they became clear to the European mind, these drastic events called into question, for many Europeans, the truth of Christianity itself. The continent in which Christianity had been nurtured for much of 800 years um, and had been deeply grounded into their cultural institutions, the site of the Reformation, would, as the 20th century evolved, abandon the church as its fundamental source of meaning and existence. Much like in the United States, the 1960s were the tipping point in which church decline um, church attendance declined, and the influence of Christianity in most Western European countries fell off a cliff. If you look above, you'll notice those dark uh, black countries are those where um, up to 41 to 70 percent of the population hold to no religious affiliation. This has led to a complete removal of Christianity from the center sphere of influence in Western and now Eastern European countries with these areas being the most secular countries in the world. This decline can be um, attributed to many factors, and many of them we've already seen in the U.S. of the same period. Especially in the 1960s, this rise of prosperity and the movement away from churches 
as Jesus himself said, it is very hard for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God because of their own sense of self-sufficiency. Also, the growing anti-establishment and individualism of the 1960s perpetuated this desire to be removed from the authority of the church. This is, in some ways, the fruit of the Enlightenment um, coming to seed in a new generation. As the established churches of uh, Europe, especially in places like Germany, Scandinavia, and the United Kingdom, are pushed to the side as just one more instrument of the status quo. This is combined with the rise of very drastic liberal theology in the denominations. Although there is a respite in some ways in the 1950s um, because of the prominence of theologians like Karl Barth, most of the official denominations in Western Europe adopted a largely liberal theology which emphasized the kind of um, closeness of God, the imminence within history, and downplayed the, the doctrines of the resurrection, the incarnation, and the need for personal salvation. As we've seen, in denominations that take this path of liberal theology quickly become irrelevant to the lives of the individuals because what is being offered is nothing other than the help offered by the world itself. These sort of forces, and many others obviously, um, led to this steady decline of religious affiliation and church membership within European countries. Each of these countries has a bit of its own story of how this took place and why the kind of wave happened at different moments. For instance, the wave of secularization did not hit Ireland until roughly the late 90s. And it was a combination of these forces as well as things like the sex scandal with the Roman Catholic Church that would finally propel a large move away from Christianity in that area. Although other stories could be told for each of these countries individually. But what Europe lacked um, that allowed America to stand up to these trends in a slightly different way was a continuous tradition of revivalism or evangelicalism that had been a counterbalance to many of these forces in the U.S. Without this force, um, much of the rise of secularization in Europe would go unchecked and still be there to this day. There are some efforts to overturn this by um, intentional evangelization in Europe, both by American Christians and international Christians. Um, many Christians from the former European colonies are actually returning into Europe to bring the gospel back to the colony, the places where they first received it from. Uh, it is definitely in question the future of Christianity in Europe and will be an interesting part of the ongoing story of Christianity there in the coming decades and centuries. Okay, moving from this kind of broad sweep of European history of the period, we need to focus in on one event that is the most significant event in Catholic Church history since the, 15th, the 14th, I'm sorry, the 16th century, the time of the Reformation, and that is Vatican II. This was the attempt by the Catholic Church to address the prevailing issues going on with modernity, and it was called from 1962 to 1965 at the Vatican itself in Rome. It was called by Pope John Paul, or sorry, John the 23rd, uh, and attempted to address the relationship of the Catholic Church to the modern world. How is it going to deal with these various um, crises that we've talked about? The fallout from World War I and World War II, the rise of communism, the rise of consumer society in the 1960s, and a general push against the truth of Christianity in the Western world in this period. The agenda for Vatican II can largely be summed up by the Italian word aggiornamento, which means an updating. The Vatican Council attempted to, according to one pope, open up the windows of the church to let the fresh air of the modern world come in. However, this was seen as a very dangerous prospect by other members of the church, fearing that um, by letting in the good of modernity, Vatican II would also allow those destructive elements of modernity that had already undermined much of the Protestant churches into the Catholic Church. So to understand why Vatican II is so important, we have to back up a little bit and look at the reaction of Roman Catholicism to modernity in the 19th century. So, some background here. 
The Catholic Church in the 19th and early 20th century was openly hostile to the ideas of modernity, seeing them as contrary to the gospel and especially contrary to the, the rules and theology of the Roman Catholic Church. This dates back all the way to the mid-19th century, especially with the revolutionary influence of much modernizing thought in that period that sought to overturn the power of the church in the southern European countries. This is partially a um, still a reaction to the French Revolution that we saw, which became extremely anti-Catholic, murdering and exiling many priests, and officially declaring a non-Christian religion as a religion of the French Republic. So the Vatican saw the waves of modernity and Enlightenment thinking as innately hostile to the Roman Church, and therefore rejected all of its um, ideas. One of the most poignant or um, forceful rejections of the modern project came with what is known as the Syllabus of Errors, which was promulgated by Pius IX in 1864. There's many errors in this, including um, capitalism, modernity, um, a reaffirmation of the rejection of Protestantism, etc. In this, it was saying these are things that good Catholics cannot believe. One of the ideas that is condemned is that, quote, the Roman pontiff can and ought to reconcile himself and come to terms with progress, liberalism, and modern civilization. So, in the 19th century, the Catholic Church was extremely anti-modern and rejected many of the calls for increased liberal policies, both liberal theology and more representative, lay-oriented Christianity that we could connect with it. This was doubled down on at Vatican I from 1869 to 1870 with the affirmation of papal infallibility, which was seen as an uh, attack on the modernist suspicion of the authority of the Church. It affirmed that the Pope, when speaking on matters of faith and morals from his official position as the Pope, could not err, therefore rejecting um, ideas of the lack of objective grounding for religious truth. This idea is perpetuated even further with the 1910 Anti-Modernist Oath, in which all incoming priests throughout the world had to take an oath rejecting many of the tenets of modern theology. This oath would persist until after the Vatican Council into the 1960s. Because of this large anti-modernist strand within Catholicism in the 19th and early 20th centuries, there are three different strands of Catholic theology leading up to the Council, each of which will kind of be felt in some way or another. And I want to explain these three strands quite briefly. The first is the Neo-Thomist strand, which sought to recover the theology of Thomas Aquinas for the modern world. The next is called the Nouvelle Théologie, or the New Theology, or Ressourcement, which sought to recover elements from the church tradition, such as the church fathers and scripture itself, to learn from and counteract modernity at the same time. And then finally, you have Catholic modernism, which sought to, in much the same way as liberal Protestant theology, to call for an updating of the Catholic faith in light of modern scientific philosophical um, thought and to bring it more in conformity with the modern world. This movement of Catholic modernism was one of the main um, the main foci of those rejections in the syllabus of errors and others. So I'm going to briefly go through each of these movements and show how they influence the events of the Vatican Council. First to look at is Neo-Thomism. This is an attempt to retrieve and update and foster the theology and the philosophy of Thomas Aquinas to deal with the problems of the modern age. This Neo-Thomas strand rejected modernity wholesale and revived the scholastic philosophy of Thomas Aquinas mediated through the 16th and 17th century uh, reform, um, Catholic scholastic movement, such as Suarez and others. This theological movement actually was the official endorsement of the Catholic Church. In response to modernity, many popes would double down and say Thomas is the philosophy that will lead us through this period. We should not adapt ourselves to modern philosophical thought, but return to the wellspring of Thomas. Um, therefore, this Thomistic philosophy became the de facto standard position of the Roman Catholic Church from the 1880s, through to the 1960s. 
This is partially perpetuated through a papal encyclical called Eterni Patris, uh, given by the Pope in 1879. This is a large document that's extolling the virtues of Thomas theology and recommending it to the church as the prime area of study to deal with the issues of the modern world. It says this, We remind each and all of you that our first and most cherished idea is that you should all furnish to studious youth a generous and copious supply of those purest streams of wisdom flowing inexhaustibly from the precious fountainhead of the angelic doctor, that is, Thomas Aquinas. So by this, um, the Vatican is calling the Catholic Church to resist modernity by going back to the medieval scholastic method. However, many would find problems with this, finding this neo-Thomism too restrictive and leading to a rather uh, arid and rigid theological system. There, there, therefore, there were movements within the Catholic Church for something new. The most significant of these movements was called the Nouvelle Théologie movement, or Ressourcement, both of these coming out of uh, thought in French Catholicism. In this, modernity can be learned from, and the church ought to return to its theological resources, such as scripture and the church fathers. So therefore, instead of returning just to Thomistic thought in order to answer the issues of the modern world, the Nouvelle Théologie theologians called for a full-scale retrieval of proper tradition and return to scriptural arguments in order to enliven the faith for the modern world. Figures of importance in this are people such as Henri de Lubac, Yves Congar, and Jean Danielou. Uh, you can see them all above. Congar sums up quite well the goal of the Nouvelle Théologie movement. He wants the church to move from a less profound to a more profound tradition, a discovery of the most profound resources. In this effort, the Nouvelle Théologie movement would issue uh, a a lot of scholarly work to reinterpret and reinvigorate the study of the fathers, the study of scripture, and make them accessible to the modern uh, Catholic theologian. However, the attempts by the Nouvelle Theologie theologians was marginalized by the magisterium or the official teaching of the Catholic Church. Many of these men were told to remain silent for many years. On the far end of the spectrum from the Neo-Thomists are the Catholic modernist movement, led by such men as George Terrell. This was a group of theologians largely influenced by Protestant liberalism, who called for a full updating of Catholic doctrine according to the needs of modern theology, something that, as we saw, was condemned in the work of Attorney Patris. Following largely German liberal theology, they emphasized religious experience, or the personal, um, over theological. Um, they emphasize that truth and doctrine developed over time, so there is no stable doctrine of the Trinity or the Incarnation or even truth, but this is a progressive revelation throughout time, and what might have been true at Nicaea or at Chalcedon need not necessarily be true today, because for the modernists, uh, doctrine itself was not literally true, but merely symbolically true. So, the symbol of the Nicene Creed could be overcome in a new symbolic reading and would not be seen by these uh, Catholic modernists to contradict the truth previously set down because truth is what is useful in the symbolic imagination of the modern period. This group went in rather radical directions and its main proponents were excommunicated by the Vatican in the early 20th century. However, fear of Catholic modernism would be a continual feature throughout the early 20th century Roman Catholic theology, which just gave larger credence to the stable project of the Neo-Thomas and continued the marginalization of the Nouvelle Théologie figures. This was all to change, however, from a very unexpected source, and that is the election of John the Twenty-Third. John the Twenty-Third was elected to the papacy in 1958 as more of a placeholder candidate. We know this because he was 76 at the time, therefore he was not expected to be in his uh, reign very long, and the conclave, the collection of bishops brought together to elect the Pope, did not elect him until the 12th ballot, which means he was a compromised candidate that nobody was particularly enthused about, but um, he nobody was particularly upset about either. However, um, John the 23rd surprised all by one of his first moves 
calling for a council to address the needs of the Catholic Church in the modern age. And one of the most significant things about John the Twenty Third uh, was that he called the Nouvelle Theologie figures out of the cold and implicitly supported their position as that of the council. All right, so we've got this lead up to Vatican II. There's this various strands in Catholic theology, all of which are vying for how is the Catholic faith going to be presented in the 20th century. Um, the council itself comes together over a series of four sessions from October 1962 until December of 1965. We're not going to be able to go into all the various things that the Vatican Council did. We'll look at a couple emphases, but each section dealt with a very specific need. Session one dealt with the liturgy and the doctrine of revelation. Therefore, how is the church to worship and what is the basis for religious truth? Sessions two and three looked at the structure and hierarchy of the church, trying to reimagine what does the structure of a Catholic church with Pope down to priest look like in the modern age. It also dealt with the relationship of the church to secular culture. Session four looked at pastoral practice and discussed the nature of freedom of religion. We'll briefly look at some of the theology of Vatican II and the things that changed um, with pre-Vatican Catholicism to post-Vatican Catholicism. So here's a couple main points of the theology of Vatican II. The Council affirmed the place of both scripture and tradition as the source for theology, contrary to the scripture alone premise of the Protestant Reformation, but uniquely presented them as unified revelations in Christ. We'll dig into this one a little deeper in a moment. Vatican II also reconceptualized the church from the idea of a perfect society to the body of Christ. Much older 19th century Catholic theology envisioned the Catholic Church as the perfect worldly nation, led by the Pope at the top as king, with various levels of administration from archbishops down to bishops down to priests, and then the, the lay people are seen in some ways as the peasantry of the kingdom of God. This is very much a top-down understanding of the Church, in which all authority runs from top to bottom. By re-emphasizing the body of Christ, there is much more room for um, the participation of the laity, that they are part of the church. Certain 19th century and earlier thought um, almost exclusively identified the church with the clergy and not with the laity itself. So this was a pretty significant re-evaluation of the nature of the church itself by the Vatican, which included much more place for the laity within an understanding of the theology of the church. Also, the council moved from the official position of extra ecclesium nolum salus, which means outside the church there is no salvation, to accepting Protestants and Eastern Orthodox as separated brethren. So, through from the Council of Trent onward, the Catholic Church acknowledged itself as the only true church of God. And all those outside of the church, especially Protestants and Eastern Orthodox, were schismatics, and their salvation would be something extraordinary. Okay. However, with Vatican II, there's a shift in this polemic, seeing Protestants and Eastern Orthodox still as not churches. Notice they are still not called churches within the Vatican documents. But they are seen as fellow brethren in Christ who are separate. So there is an, um, an, an odd relationship in Vatican II between the Catholic Church and other Christian denominations. However, it is a more conciliar doctrine than previously understood. Additionally, one of the most striking elements of Vatican II is a reversal in Catholic theology from the rejection of religious freedom, which was repeatedly rejected throughout the 19th century, and especially in the Syllabus of Errors, to the affirmation of religious freedom as a human right. Uh, these ideas are largely the influence of American Catholics on the council, especially an American bishop known as John Courtney Murray. So all of these were rather significant changes within Catholic theology, um, which would have profound effects on the makeup of the Catholic Church throughout this period. Let's look a little closer at the idea of revelation as it is reconfigured in Vatican II. So, the relationship of scripture and theology have always been a um, very tense discussion between Protestants and Catholics since the Reformation period. 
An older Catholic theology saw tradition and scripture as independent sources of revelation. Scripture gives us some truth and tradition gives us others. Okay? And that the magisterial authority of the church can interpret both of these to give theological truth. What Vatican II does is sees scripture and tradition as coming out of one unified source of theology found in the revelation and uh, speech of Christ. This is how the Vatican document Dei Verbum puts it. Hence, there exists a close connection and communication between sacred tradition and sacred scripture. For both of them, flowing from the same divine wellspring, in a certain way merge into a unity and tend towards the same end. For sacred scripture is the word of God inasmuch as it is condigned to writing under the inspiration of the divine spirit, while sacred tradition takes the word of God entrusted by Christ the Lord and the Holy Spirit to the apostles and hands it on to their successors in its full purity, so that, led by the light of the spirit of truth, they may, in proclaiming it, preserve this word of God faithfully, explain it, and make it more widely known. Consequently, it is not from scripture alone that the church draws her certainty about everything which has been revealed. Therefore, both sacred tradition and sacred scripture are to be accepted and venerated with the same sense of loyalty and reverence. So, first we see here, some things have not changed. Much as the church after uh, Trent maintained, scripture alone is rejected. There is some sort of unwritten tradition that gives additional, um, additional teachings handed down by the apostles, um, guaranteed in the Catholic view by the Holy Spirit. However, by putting scripture and tradition under the same lens of coming from this divine wellspring of Christ, they're bringing them closer together and leading the church to uh, focus much more on scripture than it had in previous generations. It's not as if these are two sources of truth, but theology and tradition merge together in this new Catholic theology in order to bring the people to a closer understanding of the revelation of God. This is still a very problematic theology with its insistence on this tradition that is really not stable or well known and has many elements in it that are clearly contradictory to the words of scripture themselves. But in this, we have a much more unified understanding of revelation. And uh, if you dig into this theology a bit, you see the influence of Karl Barth as this emphasis on Christ as the central revelation of God's own self. And the Catholic Church sees this mediated primarily through scripture, but also as tradition. So this is one main shift within Catholic theology of Vatican II. Let's briefly look at some more. On the more practical side, before Vatican II, since the Council of Trent, the Mass, or the weekly celebration of the Eucharist in Catholic, uh, Catholic Masses, um, was in Latin, and the priests faced away from the congregation. So many people did not follow what was going on, nor were the, was there much participation. Also, in the service, there was only two scripture readings. The laity only ate the bread at communion, um, and almost all of the activities, both of church and in the service, were focused on the clergy. Only the priests could read the Bible, in worship service, and the laity were generally discouraged from reading it on their own uh, and failing to understand, uh, with the church saying that they were not authorized to interpret the word in themselves. It also emphasized papal supremacy as the highest kind of level of order, and everything was subordinated to the papacy, and as we've said, extra ecclesium nola solis, that there is no salvation outside the church, and there is no religious freedom. All these things were standard elements of Catholicism before Vatican II. Vatican II changed much of this. It was approved that the Mass could be held in the vernacular. This was just a suggestion, but almost immediately after the, the Council, all the churches throughout the world would move to a vernacular liturgy. And the priests would turn around to face the congregation, making it much more participatory and in the language of the people. They would increase the scripture readings from two to three, which corresponded with an increased emphasis on scripture within the post-Vatican II church. The laity were allowed to have both the bread and the wine at communion. So we see in these first couple elements this emphasis on scripture, mass in the vernacular, uh, more accessible priests, and the bread and the wine that 
Uh, in some ways, this is overturning much of the Counter-Reformation principles uh, of the 16th century. In some ways, Vatican II is saying on many of these issues, the Protestant reformers got it right, um, although that is often not something that they would like to admit. This re-understanding of the church as the body of Christ and not just the perfect society also allowed much more lay involvement within the church, that they would be more in, uh, involved within the mass and also within the life of parish ministry as a whole. There was a move to encourage Bible reading by all. However, it should be noted, there was also an approval of historical critical methods of scriptural interpretation at Vatican II, opening up um, much of Catholicism to the corrosive elements of liberal theology um, that they were hoping to avoid. In addition to papal supremacy, which was not overturned by any means by Vatican II, was added an emphasis on the collegiality of bishops. So the Pope is seen as one bishop amongst many. He has the most authority, but in this system, uh, more authority has been given to the local bishop to determine the needs of his own particular flock. And we've already seen as well that the church moves from this idea of a rejection of all other Christian denominations to seeing them as separated brethren. So we are still, as Protestants, not um, in churches. Um, we do not have valid sacraments, but are still recognized in some senses as brothers uh, in Christ, which is better than pre-Vatican II, in which we were anathematized. And also the Vatican Council affirmed the freedom of religion. So seeing all these changes, you can see how Vatican II would uh, have a massive impact for Catholicism around the world as the fundamental experience of going to church for uh, roughly a billion people was changed by this one event. What people have been doing for their entire lives of going to the service, hearing it in Latin with the priests facing away with almost no lay involvement and little scripture in this one event had been completely transformed into a very different experience. As one might imagine, this drastic change was received differently by different members of the church and would lead to many of the controversies that would exist within the Catholic Church even to the present day. To get a sense on how the Council has been received by Roman Catholics, we can look at the comments made by Benedict XVI, who was himself a theological advisor at the Council and later Pope. Um, you see an example of him at the Council itself. Uh, in 1962. In his read on the Council, uh, which is published in the preface to the conciliar documents, which I would recommend you read if you have a chance, he proposes two different ways that Catholics have received the Council. One is the hermeneutics of continuity. In this group, largely following the Nouvelle Theologie movement and Rahner's or, uh, sorry, uh, Ratzinger's preferred reading, uh, they see this as an emphasis on the Council as a clarification a previous doctrine, and a movement away from unnecessary elements that were causing stumbling blocks to the world. So in this hermeneutic continuity, Vatican II is not a massive change. It's merely a tweak and a re-emphasis that is going on in the same way. And therefore, to be in the spirit of the council is to continue on the doctrines of the church reaching back to the ancient period and uh, living in the, the spirit of traditional Catholic doctrine. However, there is another strand of reception of the council, which is which Benedict calls the hermeneutics of rupture. This idea sees the Vatican II as a complete break with the past, an overturning of fundamental Catholic ideas about the nature of authority, about the nature of the church. Uh, and in many ways, the hermeneutics of rupture is a return to a new era of Catholic modernism which emphasizes an overcoming of Catholic doctrine and invokes the spirit of the Council to push for further change. Within Catholicism, even today, these forces of continuity and rupture vie for the fate of the Catholic Church, and many of the struggles within Catholicism um, are a result of this. Did the Vatican Council ultimately reject um, fundamental claims about Catholic doctrine? And therefore, is the church open to more changes in um, the future to stay up with the spirit of the age? Those promoting the hermeneutics of rupture would say so. Part of these strands are already present within the council itself. I mentioned that Vatican II adopted an approval of the higher critical method, 
which rejects the in inerrancy and even the infallibility of the Christian text, which have called some priests and Catholic theologians for um, much more movement in the Catholic Church towards a theological liberal position. Another element that was kind of taken from the Council was the idea of religious inclusivism, that um, salvation can be found outside of the church, not just in other Christian denominations, but in other Christian religions. This was purported by a Catholic theologian named Karl Rahner, who argued that many outside the church and members of other faiths are anonymous Christians who can be saved by practicing their own religion, but still in Christ. These ideas have become very prominent within Catholicism, and um, largely to the extent that such positions as the need for Christ for salvation, um, explicit faith in Christ, um, are, are very lax in most Western Catholic theologians, with some pushing all the way to a universalistic salvation. However, others who push the hermeneutics of continuity fight back against the liberal trends within the Catholic Church, um, having some success, especially in Africa, which is the kind of heartland of conservative Catholicism to this day, um, while Western Europe is the heartland of Catholic liberalism. Why do I mention all this? It's a, it's a lot of stuff. Partially, it's that when we interact with the Catholic Church, we have to understand that we're not interacting with the Catholic Church from the 16th century. Many things have changed. The Catholic Church is as diverse as the Protestant churches even at this moment. And much of the struggles between Protestant liberal theology and Protestant conservative theology can be seen in their own ways within the Catholic Church, which is riven between these various forces. And that can be divvied up and sometimes according to certain religious orders or areas of the world. Most of these forces were kept in bay for much of the rest of the 20th century, largely because of the papacy of John Paul II, who would push very hard the hermeneutics of continuity. In some ways, John Paul II is also significant as the first modern pope. He traveled extensively throughout the world, which was not the case for many former popes who would largely reside only in Italy. Uh, he was Polish by birth and helped to undermine the communist regimes of that era. Um, by bringing a spotlight to the oppression of the, the Polish people by the communist government. John Paul II would really bring the Catholic Church to prominence in the modern world, showing a side in which the Catholic Church was not just opposed to modernity, but could be a force of international altruism. Um, and in some ways, regardless of what we think about the Catholic Church, it's something that we must keep hold of because the Pope is always going to be the most visible Christian in the world, and his actions, uh, regardless of uh, our um, lack of allegiance to the Pope, will be reflected on by the unbelieving world to represent in some way um, the Christian position. This has been more difficult in recent years because of the papacy of Francis I, who um, is kind of caught up in this reception of Vatican II, with many um, conservative Catholics fearing that he is taking much more the hermeneutic of rupture and trying to continue to reform central church doctrines um, to accommodate itself to the modern world. All right, so we've looked at Vatican II. We're going to stop on Catholicism there. Seeing that these forces are extremely influential to this day, and what the story of the future of Catholicism is will be determined by which reading of Vatican II wins out. And as we interact with Catholic thought and Catholic thinkers, uh, we should be very aware of these various trajectories within modern Catholicism. Moving from there, I want to take a look briefly at the Lausanne 1974 conference, which is in some ways the rise of the evangelical movement to international prominence. In some ways, Lausanne 1974 is the evangelical equivalent of the Vatican II conference and the World Council of Churches. In July 16, 1974, representatives from 150 countries gathered together in Lausanne, Switzerland at the Congress on World Evangelization. 
This Congress was largely meant to perpetuate the original purpose of Edinburgh 1910, to promote a supernatural, God-centered gospel to the lost. This was seen as necessary because of the abandonment of the World Council of Churches, of the mission of evangelism in favor of social action and more pluralistic and universalist understandings. In some ways, the Congress of World Evangelism does a much better job of encouraging um, influence from the non-Western world in the mission of world evangelization. However, at the first conference, it is still pre predominantly controlled by those of um, Western descent, especially Anglo-American. This is partially because the Congress was organized by Billy Graham and John Stott, who was one of the leading uh, evangelical Anglicans of his day. But it was also brought about in coordination with international evangelical parachurch groups. Uh, think of groups such as InterVarsity, uh, Campus Crusade, etc. Graham opened up the Congress with a speech emphasizing the biblical concepts that were essential to world evangelization, in contrast from what was seen from the liberal theology of the day. He emphasized the authority of Scripture as the final truth of God, that humans are lost without Christ and they need him, that salvation therefore comes in Christ alone, and that we must witness to Christ's work in both our words and our deeds, and that evangelism is a necessary element of Christian life in order to pursue the gospel. These are themes that we've seen echoed in the rise of evangelism um, from the time of the first Great Awakenings in America, and Luzon kind of presents these to the entire world. Stott then elaborated on these themes by giving their biblical and theological foundation. In some ways, Billy Graham was the, um, the face and the voice of this conference, and Stott was the theological mind behind it. But at Luzon, we actually see some of the first influence uh, of non-Western evangelical leadership. Because of urgings from many Latin American delegates, Stott pushed the organization further uh, to acknowledge social action must be done alongside evangelism. Okay? This caused tension with many of the American evangelicals. So we, to understand this, we need to go back. Remember, in the early 20th century, um, missions seemed to be compromised from the American perspective because of a substitution of social justice over evangelism and almost complete rejection of evangelism as a goal of the Christian church. Therefore, there was the great reaction because of the emphasis of the social gospel. Many American conservative Protestants basically stepped away from social action and advocating for social justice um, because it was seen as a primarily liberal concern. This would be maintained through the evangelical movement of the 1950s and into the 70s. Because, um, I mean, this is something you always have to be aware of in the story of overreaction. Evangelicals often reject anything that seems to them to be liberal, um, just as many Protestants reject anything that seemed to be Catholic. Um, this is just not a helpful practice. Uh, we should do that which the, Bibli the Bible commands us to do as proper evangelical Protestants and not shy away from doing biblically commanded things because they might seem to be liberal or Catholic. This was a shortcoming of much Western evangelicalism, and therefore by these urging of the Latin American and um, majority world, world delegates, Stott would push this agenda so that there would be a unity of even evangelism and social action very carefully defined. And this is all set forth in what is known as Lo the Lausanne Covenant of 1974, which very well balances the demands of evangelism to the lost and the need for a personal relationship with Christ, as well as social action. Let's see how it does it. So it begins, We affirm that God is both the creator and the judge of all people. We therefore should share his concern for justice and reconciliation throughout human society, and for the liberation of men and women from every kind of oppression. Because men and women are made in the image of God, every person, regardless of race, religion, color, culture, class, sex, or age, has an intrinsic dignity because of which he or she should be respected and served, not exploited. Here, too, we express penitence, uh, both for our neglect and for having sometimes regarded evangelism and social concern as mutually exclusive. This is from Lausanne, 
uh, section 5. We see in here many elements that are important to remember in this kind of coming of age of world evangelism or world evangelicalism to the concerns of social justice. These concerns for both evangelism and the idea of social action are grounded in God as the creator and judge of all humanity, as well as human beings being made in his image. Because humans are made in the image of God, there is an innate dignity, and therefore it is the call for all Christians to respect that dignity and to seek to promote the human flourishing in every area of life. And notice here the the evangelicals are being very um, repentant even of seeing this contrast between preaching the gospel and social concern, arguing that they must go together and should not be seen as mutually exclusive. This is an important theme for us all to uh, wrestle with even today. The covenant continues. Although reconciliation with other people is not reconciliation with God, nor is social action evangelism, nor is political liberation salvation, Nevertheless, we affirm that evangelicalism or evangelism and social political involvement are both parts of our Christian duty, for both are necessary expressions of our doctrines of God and man, our love for our neighbor, and our obedience to Jesus Christ. The message of salvation implies also a message of judgment upon every form of alienation, oppression, and discrimination, and we should not be afraid to denounce evil and injustice wherever they exist. So in this, they're balancing things very carefully, seeing that reconciliation between human beings is not reconciliation with God. It is not good enough. There needs to be a true conversion. The lost need to be found by Christ. Political liberation is not salvation. It is not enough. It is a good thing, as they go on to say, and the push to dispense with alienation, oppression, and discrimination is a proper duty of the redeemed in Christ. So we see here them balancing these two themes, the utter importance of evangelism to the lost and the need to spread the gospel, and the need to act morally and virtuously in the world in order to promote the good of our fellow human beings. Much of the Lausanne Covenant uh, is very helpful reading to be reflected upon, and in some ways it represents the reversal of that great reversal uh, that we saw with response to the social gospel in the early 20th century. Okay. The International Evangelical Coordination uh, from Lausanne 1974 was continued through several smaller regional events held over the next uh, several decades. Most significant of this was two major uh, continuation conferences, one in Manila in the Philippines in 1989, and then more recently in Cape Town, South Africa in 2011. These further solidified the inclusion of the Global South into evangelical leadership. While Lausanne 1974 was still very much headed largely by um, Anglo-American English speakers, the subsequent meetings at Manila and Cape Town would increase the leadership of the Global South in these endeavors. However, it should be noted that because of the decentralized nature of evangelicalism and its movement, uh, the Lausanne movement lacked the organizational follow-through that we see with the WCC and Vatican II. But this is largely due to a different kind of need on the ground. Many of the delegates to the Lausanne conferences are not necessarily representing denominations, but more informal movements that are coordinating to spread the gospel throughout the world. And in some ways, this is just indicative of the nature of evangelism or evangelicalism in the 20th century. Much more grassroots, much um, more um, movement-based than denominationally based, um, bringing together more informal ties. Noel puts it this way, the Congress and connected events illustrated an important fact about recent history. For a growing proportion of the world's Christian population, informal organizations and ad hoc relationships have increasingly acquired the kind of influence that were once mostly exercised by formal organizations and inherited well-defined relationships. What Noel is saying here is because of the complex nature of the modern globalized international order of Christianity, we're seeing a shift away from more formal organizational patterns, such as traditional denominations or missions boards, to a more loosely knit yet organically connected group of informal organizations. 
And I think that's a trend we're going to continue to see. There are benefits to both. Um, the local informal organizations are more adaptable um, and do not have to deal with um, necessarily as much red tape and mutual agreement. However, they can have a tendency uh, to lead to compromise and to a lack of overall accountability within their movements. All right, to this last actually, we've seen some of these major uh, trends and events throughout the 20th century. We looked at the rise of the neo-Orthodox movement through Karl Barth. We looked at the decline of religion in Europe, the Vatican II Conference, and Lausanne 1974 is symbolizing the global power of evangelicalism in the modern age. So let's bring some of these themes together of the 20th century that we've looked at the last few times and think a little bit about their future importance. So one of the main themes we've been coming back to again and again in the 20th century is the decline of Christianity in the West. Both in Western Europe and in North America, Christianity has declined in the 20th century, moving into a much more post-Christian culture in which the traditional place of Christianity as the default presuppositions of both the believer and the unbeliever are being lost. This has been the result of various effects of prosperity, a failure of the church, and of increasing secularization in society. One of the largest emphases of Christianity in the West is how to properly engage with these endeavors, how to bring the gospel and see North America and Europe as a missions field once again, as it always was. How can the methods and the ideas of American revivalism and Protestant Reformational theology come to over to bring back Christianity into the Western culture? Tied with the decline on the global north has been the rise of Christianity in the global south. We talked about this in our book with the unexpected century. It was thought that the West would continue in its growth in Christianity while the global South would slowly become Christian. In fact, those were completely reversed with the decline in the West and the rise of the global South. There are many stories that one could tell of this rise, and it's very particular to each region, each country, and many figures that we were not able to look into. But the future of Christianity will be a much more globalized faith as those from the north and those from the south seek to work together to bring about the truth of Christ in, um, in a unified way. The rise of the global south calls upon the north to relinquish some of its control and uh, makes us rethink about Christianity not as a western religion but truly as a global faith. And the Global South will struggle in the coming years to figure out what does it mean to live out Christianity in their own context without compromising the gospel or without making some of the mistakes that the Western Church has. And in that we can see um, one of the biggest changes in the 20th century is what does it mean for Christians to live in the ruins of Christendom, in which for over a millennium, Christianity was seen as the default joint of power between church and state, that the church was given a certain intellectual respectability and default mood. What does it mean for Christians in the North to live um, without this protection? How can we look to the past, look to our global Southern brothers and sisters to learn what does it mean to live as um, disempowered minorities? in a largely post-Christian co context. And also, what does it mean for the Global South as they seek to express their Christian values in every area of society? Will there be a new Christendom of the Global South? Uh, and if so, can they avoid many of the errors that we see in the history of Western European Christianity? And all this comes down to a continued need of Christian, the Christian church, to reckon with the nature of modernity. How do we respond to increased secularization? How do we respond to modern theology? How do we respond to the sexual revolution and the rise of technology? All these things are going to be continual struggles in the coming decades to figure out what does it mean to be Christian in the modern world in such a way that the truth of the Bible is upheld, a commitment to Christian morality, and obedience to God in all things are done properly in light of the society in which we actually live. Many of these themes could be elaborated on extensively, 
but as we think about the future of the story of Christianity, these are going to be the plot lines that will need to be devised. All right, we've come to the end of our course. There's much more we could have talked about in all of this. Remember, the story of Christianity I've been presenting is only some high points or important movements. Many more can be discussed. The story of Christianity is always local and can be devolved to even the local church. The story of Christianity in its fullness is not just about significant movements or figures or theologians, but it is about every single congregation where Christ is preached, his word is proclaimed, and his will is followed. In this, we all are an essential part of the story of Christianity. How can we learn from the histories of the past, the stories of our fellow brothers and sisters who've gone before us, so that we can more faithfully live before Christ here and now. As I hope this class has helped you to understand some of the contours of the story, how God, how God has been faithful to his church across time, seeing the inspiration of brothers and sisters from the past, and seeing the failures that we can learn from. But in all of this, I think we can take that, despite where the church might seem to be, good or bad, there's always the danger of giving into the spirit of the age, of compromising the gospel for expediency, for power, or fear. But at the same time, despite the failures of the church, despite how dark it might seem, we must live out of the hope that God is sovereign and he will protect his church. As much as we learn this story, we should be able to say that we have no idea what could happen next, because God is king, and there is no way to know what the church might look like in another 10, 20, or 30 years. But learning from the past, we can be wise, we can be faithful, and we can have hope that regardless of what occurs, God is on the throne, Jesus reigns, and he will bring his church to redemption. And we can go forward in faith, filled uh, up by this great cloud of witnesses, to live out our part in that story until the Lord returns.